Hello, my name is Alma Robinson and I am the Executive Director of California Lawyers for the Arts. CLA is a statewide nonprofit organization that was founded in 1974 to serve artists and arts organizations of all disciplines with advocacy as well as services that provide support with legal and business issues. With staffed offices in San Francisco, Berkeley, Sacramento, Los Angeles, and San Diego, we provide several core services. First, we provide legal counseling to specialized attorneys who provide assistance with a variety of intellectual property questions, as well as contract reviews and negotiations and other important business issues. Depending on the client's financial status, legal assistance may be available on a pro bono or reduced fee basis. We also provide a specialized program that assists independent inventors and small startups with their patent applications. To help with situations involving disputes, we provide a range of alternative services, including negotiations counseling, mediation, and arbitration that can avoid the expense and hassle of going to court. Finally, we offer a full menu of educational programs that include workshops, symposia, and conferences on various legal topics for artists and arts organizations. Many of these programs are posted on our YouTube channel, and we encourage you to use these tools to educate yourself on the legal issues before you reach out for specialized assistance from our organization. Thank you for joining today's program, and please consider joining CLA on our website at www.calawyersfortheartsorg so that we can continue to maintain our full range of services. Thank you. So that was the lovely Alma Robinson telling you all about CLA. With that all said, it's finally time to let Megan Xavier and Mark Solinger introduce themselves. First, Megan, why don't you tell us why a lawyer is here today to talk about podcasting? Thank you, Renee. My name is Megan Xavier, and I am an attorney representing primarily other lawyers. And I represent lawyers on ethics issues. So when we get in trouble, like a client has complained and the State Bar of California is investigating us, I do the defending. So that's kind of my world. And I'm here mostly because I also am a podcaster. And so I've dealt with some of the sort of legal side of starting a podcast, going from an idea to a full-fledged show. And you might wonder like, why would a lawyer have a podcast? Well, I talked about exactly what I do and that's ethics issues. So my podcast is called Lawyers Gone Ethical. And it's essentially talking about ethical issues facing lawyers and the audience is other lawyers. You can see I can't surround myself with lawyers <laughs> and now and then I get out. And so that's why I'm out tonight. So it's fun to to be here and talk to you guys who are you know thinking of doing podcasts or involved in the podcast world. My name is Mark Solinger. I'm a public radio producer and a podcaster from the public radio side. I've worked on Marketplace and uh, Innovation Hub out of WGBH. So I have a lot of experience editing interviews, producing radio and podcasts from a more news, interview-based and nonfiction side. In addition to that, I'm also the co-founder of a audio drama. And if you're wondering what an audio drama is, it's basically a fiction podcast. So I think TV show without the visuals, an audio drama production company called Dead Signals. We're most well known for Archive 81, which is a fiction podcast. It's a horror, science fiction, creepy little thing. It's pretty popular being adapted into a Netflix show, which will hopefully come out in a couple months by uh, James Wan. So that's uh, really fun. And I'm here to you know, talk a little bit about uh, podcasting, IP, getting releases, making sure that, you know, if you accidentally, if you have a handshake deal with a friend who's a songwriter, they can't come at you for about $3,000. I think there's good. a story there, Mark. No, no, I was just <laughs> doing, thinking of a completely hypothetical example. Um, totally, totally unrelated. But yeah, and I'm really excited to be here.
Well, thanks both of you for making your in introduction. This is a question for both of you. What uh, drove you to going from, oh, I have this idea to podcast is going to be the correct format for pursuing this idea? How did you make that decision to get to the podcast stage? I can tell you sort of my, my story on that. So for me, it was partly an avenue for marketing my law practice, marketing without marketing, without being out there to saying, it's not a call me name on the side of the bus. My practice isn't really that kind of a practice. I am more, my, my practice grows by people knowing who I am and that I know what I'm talking about. And my audience is other lawyers. So I do a lot of writing in terms of articles that are published in on lawyer websites and in lawyer magazines. But I wanted to get into something that was a little more interactive and innovative, but video kind of never really took off for us. Tried that, but it wasn't, it wasn't my thing. And so it also wasn't my colleagues thing when I wanted to do things like interview my colleagues who had, were doing cool things or had interesting issues to discuss. Be like, oh, it's not video, is it? And so video kind of wasn't the thing for us. And then I Really, I met a podcast producer, Nicola Bood had a wonderful podcast called The Gen Y Lawyer, was very well known for her work, particularly in the millennial space. Like she presented on millennials as employees, millennials as clients, like she kind of ran with the theme. And so The Gen Y Lawyer was a really popular podcast and she was getting into producing and she and I met and she was like, well, here's a potential solution to your problem. What about podcasting? So we looked at in the space and found there was no one talking about the things I want to talk about on a podcast. Like it just wasn't out there. So we figured essentially, let's give this a try, right? Um, like everyone with an idea, you got to kind of launch it to see if it works. And it really did work. I found a lot of my colleagues, some people who I would never have an hour to sit down and talk to, like they wouldn't have an hour for me just for fun right? They would make an hour to talk on a podcast. And so I was able to interview people of all, all across the spectrum within law, doing a lot of innovation, people who were really clawing away at issues that were plaguing the profession and the public seeking to utilize the profession. And they were able to really produce a lot of really interesting episodes for our audience because they were talking about things that people would only hear about in passing. And so since it got some traction and people were interested, we really ran with it. It hasn't, we haven't put out new episodes in a while, but it was weekly for a very long time. And that's sort of how, how it all developed from like, oh, I want to talk to my audience out there and showcase my expertise. So they know who to call if they do have an ethics problem, but that kind of ended up being a side benefit, to be honest. It was more about talking about issues and getting the word out about things that other lawyers were doing or about problems that we were facing that maybe people weren't diving into a lot. They were sort of getting the surface level Twitter version. And now they could have a 45 minute conversation in their ears instead. So essentially uh, how I got into podcasting, I went to college for it. Not essentially, I, I didn't go to college for it specifically, but I've been interested in audio and audio storytelling ever since I was there. And if you meet any public radio person, and they, they're going to tell you a version of this story. I heard an episode of This American Life when I was young, and I was like, okay, cool. This is what I want to do. So I went to college for uh, radio, television, film at Syracuse. And while I was there, I uh, studied journalism, audio production, a bit of everything. And for my senior thesis project, I made a uh, weird audio drama because I've always enjoyed uh, weird strange, cool audio drama and audio fiction. And after college, I worked at PBS NewsHour, Marketplace, and uh, Innovation, Innovation Hub, which I'm currently at, at DBH. So that's more of a standard public radio trajectory. Obviously, most of the shows on public radio are, are podcasts. So it's, it's very much a podcast slash public radio thing. As for um, Archive 81, uh, me and my uh, friend and co-producer. Oh, also, just just so everybody knows, uh, the name of the podcast I'm most known for is Archive 81. And so uh, Dan and I, uh, who's, who is now the engineer at The Daily, basically decided that we were, you know, I think he was working at the at, on a uh, sound effects library, and I was getting coffee for Gwen Eiffel, which when I was a, was a wonderful, wonderful person, I'm very kind and great, 
but you know, it's it's not the most creative, creatively fulfilling job experience. And so what we decided to do was create an audio drama together. And that eventually became our private one. And it started out just as a way that we could, you know, tell stories from an audio perspective and and eventually it spiraled into its own LLC and its own production company. And, you know, now I'm being played by Matt McGorry on Netflix. It's very, very strange. My new goal in life is to have someone play me on TV. Like that's, <laughs> so I know we can like nerd out about specific equipment, but mm -hmm. let's go on a basic level. So, you know, part of the reason why podcasting has become so popular is that it's very easy to, to do it on, you know, your laptop and your phone already have a lot of the requirements necessary. But what kind of equipment would you suggest people get to, or what should people have if they're just starting their podcast and what will make it seem a little bit more polished than just like, oh, I'm just talking on my phone and putting it online. I can start with this if, if that's okay. So you might have seen from my, my reaction to, you can start it with your phone and your laptop. You can, you shouldn't. So essentially the, the issue is, is that for a lot of, when people talk about podcasting, they say, oh, the barriers to entry are really low. And that's extremely, that's very true. The barriers are entry to really low. But there's a second part of you know, that sentence. The, the second part of that sentence is the barriers to entry are extremely low compared to television. That's what most people have said. And that's very true. Like, if you wanted to create a, like the budget for the Archive 81 show on Netflix is... Netflix's catering budget is a hundred percent is definitely much more than our entire budget for the first three three seasons. And with uh, with more nonfiction, with with stuff like that, like it's still so much lower compared to television. But the barriers to entry are still there. So essentially, to make a podcast that sounds good, that is going to reflect well on you it really you do need a fair amount of technical know-how and a fair a fair amount of high-end equipment and by high-end i mean like probably if you if you want to get good microphones and a good recorder i would recommend a, a zoom h4 4n or a task cam as a personal recorder you can get either a shotgun mic or a okay, this is probably going to be too technical. Just just a standard Yeti would be fine. I think that basically the issue is that like when people say it's very easy to start a podcast, it's very easy to start a bad podcast. Just like you know, it's very easy to start a YouTube video. Yeah, it's it's a, a show or whatever. It's very easy to start anything. It's very hard to make it good. And I think that like the one thing I would I would urge people to do is there's a bunch of really, really good resources out there on making audio and making audio that sounds good. Two places I would uh, direct people are transom.org, which is a really, really great resource, resource for um, audio producers, has a bunch of questions, FAQs, like how-to guides, because I'm not going to like tell you everything you need to know in a, in a, in a three-hour presentation. The other thing I would say, the other guide I would suggest looking for is NPR has a bunch of really, really good how to make audio guidelines. And it's it's directed at a high school level. You do not need to know anything to start it and just poke around there. I have my own personal preferences for recording equipment and stuff. But the, the thing is like, I, I would say the barriers are to making a good podcast are there, but they're lower than a lot of other mediums and they're definitely surmountable. Yeah, Mark definitely knows way more about all the technical side than I do, but I'll throw in there as like the non-AV person who just was like, hey, I have this idea, I want to start a podcast. Getting the advice of someone who's done it before is so valuable. I was swimming 
in, you know, gobbledygook information. And I'm like, I don't even understand the adjectives being used. Like, I don't understand what I was talking about, but I did learn, you know, at least get a very good quality microphone, you know, spring for one. I started off with the Yeti, which you can see in my screen here it was like my entry level. And then I upgraded when I realized, okay, I can do better, but I got started with it. You know, you don't need to start with a ton of equipment or really more than that, you don't need to get stalled over not being able to figure out what to do. Get some basics, know that being on your phone and using your phone's audio jack is probably not going to fly. Okay. Don't make that kind of podcast, but don't let figuring out your equipment stop you from launching a good idea. I always say like the, the little thing in the back of my head is I started listening to podcasts before I started making one. I wasn't a podcast listener when this idea came my way. And I still remember, I have no idea what they were talking about, like what the show was about. I somehow thought it looked interesting. So I downloaded it. And I listened to this episode of this one show. It was a husband and wife talking. And apparently that was like their entire premise was like conversations between them. And one of them, they were on a run. Okay. So they're jogging and huffing and puffing as they talked into, I can only assume they're like AirPods or whatever. Like, I mean, it was nothing good quality. And they're literally like, you can hear them breathing. Don't make that podcast, (laughs) but also get out there and make a good idea happen with some basic know-how and advice on your equipment. Before I step into the next question, and I think we're going to get a little bit more on that legal technical side. I do see some questions coming in asking about like the visual aspect of podcasting. And to clarify, podcasting is literally just an audio format. You might sometimes see people post videos on YouTube of them in a recording studio and it looks like they're talking on a radio show as and that's a podcast. But really, that that's kind of like two for one. That's like the video that is separately recording the person doing their radio slash podcasting broadcast. So we aren't really going to have any tips on the visual end of that because that's not actually part of the podcasting genre. However, um, we do often have workshops about film and television and stuff. So maybe one day we'll get into that nitty gritty on on the visual aspect. Um, And also to clarify, blogging is just the act of writing. So if I have a website and I like to type up my ideas, Um, That is just a blog. And if I wanted to talk about them, then that's a podcast. So sometimes you have both a blog and a podcast, but they're also two separate things. So hopefully that can clarify a few of those questions trickling in. Now, when we talk about things, so a lot of you guys have had guests on your podcast or in your case, marquee of actors on your podcast. When you're recording and using that audio, what are some of the like permissions you have to work around or like consent or or rules about what kind of audio can be used when you are working with somebody that will be on your podcast? On mine, it's just strictly guests, right? So they're not actors. They're not being paid for any of their appearances, anything like that. They're appearing as themselves to talk about issues that are important to them. And we do have a scheduling link that we kind of make this an all-in-one. So if you're going to record a podcast with me, there's a scheduling link to pick the time. As you go through filling out the form, there's a release in there that essentially says, you know, that everything that they say on the recorded portion of the podcast, we can use to put out on the podcast and to market that episode. So that's sort of how we handle our release. It's really simple from our end. And our our guests are nearly always lawyers and they're, they kind of know that they're coming on a recorded podcast for it to go out there, but they still have that basic release that we do. I'm sure Mark's are probably more involved or he has, he's got more to say on that. Oh, well, I mean, it depends for like actors. We have like essentially pretty much the same release you would have for film and TV actors. Just, Hey, we can use your voice. We're paying you a certain amount. Who's your promotion? Who's your credits? All that stuff. And it's very, very much a template thing. For NPR and interview stuff, we don't, no one at NPR this for me since someone loses. Um, I don't know if that's, they should be doing that. But essentially, like the understanding is if you are 
going to be on a, a guest on a recorded podcast, that's essentially that there's an understanding there. I mean, maybe we should have them, but, you know, nobody on Fresh Air or basically any podcast on NPR or, or radio show has, has releases. And I, I, I mean, probably take Megan's advice because she's a lawyer and I'm most certainly not, but I have never used releases for people that were being interviewed and not paid. For what it's worth, it's a belt and suspenders to me. I mean, yeah. I, again, I would never let that stop you from getting started. I don't see anybody ever raising a beef that they went on a recorded podcast and said something and now you're using it. Oh, goodness. Well, that was the point. So I don't think it's a particularly important thing to make sure you have. If you are using audio from like somebody's archive or from another source and using it as a clip in your show, are there some legal or copyright issues you have to think about with that? Yeah, absolutely. This is, I mean, almost every show will have it just with intro music alone, right? So right there, you already are going to be using something you didn't create. So anything you use or play on your show, you have to make sure you have proper copyright clearances. And those should always be written so that you have that in, you know, in hand if there's ever an issue. And one of the questions that we had come in before the show was actually kind of about that issue that one of the platforms had removed an episode or maybe it was even their whole show because the platform thought there was a copyright infringement problem. And, you know, she had to be able to show, no, there's not. Here's how I got the right to use all of the audio that appears in the episode. So anytime you use something, not only do you need to make sure you have permission, but that permission needs to be documented because you may need that. And you don't know when you may need it. You may need it two years from now when you find one of your episodes got pulled and you don't know why. For NPR stuff, you, you, know, you have a music database that you like sign off and it's, it's a form system for that. Like for news programs, you are allowed to play clips if they are 100% news related. So I just produced an episode about the history of marriage equality in the US and we used a few clips from Bill Clinton and from John Kerry and Bob Dole and stuff. And those are obviously like if news related and, uh, and publicly fine. So this kind of ties into, so we had one question about somebody who wants to start specifically a podcast on investments, but I'm going to make this slightly more broad. If you're doing a podcast where you're giving people advice and, and making recommendations, I know lawyers always love the, this is not legal advice, <laughs> but are there liabilities that you may face if your show is like telling people to do certain things or like you're, you're making financial or legal, uh, advice and and is there some is would there be any complications with your podcast doing stuff like that yeah i mean we certainly face that in law right all the time <laughs> like and lawyers are the usually the ones to stumble and go wait can i say this should i talk about this and my answer to that is always you want to discuss a topic you want to talk about giving information you're not really in a position to give advice to anyone because this is a one-way street. This isn't a conversation that you're having with your, the member of your audience. They can't tell you what their specific issues are so you can advise them. You are simply putting out information. And I think that can be done in a way that's both clear to your audience and not overwhelmingly disclaimed. You know, you like the, the fine print at the end of the medical ads, you know, the pharmaceutical ads where you're like, wait, I'm going to have what happen to me? It doesn't need to be longer than your show. But you can easily say, well, you know, here's an interesting new investment vehicle that I've been learning about. Here's what I've learned and I find it really interesting and it could be useful in this arena or that one. It seems like this other arena might be kind of dangerous over there. But again, these are just sort of my thoughts and it's kind of a new thing I'm learning about, right? You're not saying, if you are in this position, if these facts apply to you, do this or do that. You don't want to be that overly specific because someone might run with that and think you gave them that advice. But in truth, you really can't advise anyone because you're not hearing their stories. So just focus on discussing a topic and sharing information. And that usually keeps you in the clear. 
Yeah, disclaimers are great, but not too many. And yeah, that's a good point. Making distinction between this is just my thoughts versus I am telling you to do something. That's a that sounds like a really good distinction. So when you both were starting out, and Mark, this could be more for Archive eighty one mm-hmm. since NPR has that built in audience. How did how did you build an audience? How did you get the word out? How like what did you do to be like? Is anyone going to listen to my podcast except for my mom and dad? <laughs> so for mine, um, social media was a big thing. So already, you know, having developed something of a following on social media, we put out every episode, you know, with a special graphic, you know, designed for that episode across social media. Also having guests on who would also promote it. So you kind of, you know, tap into their audience on their own. For me, and this is going to be different, you know, certainly this is appropriate for my show as opposed to a drama, but I also would podcast from legal conferences so that's kind of a thing in in-person legal conferences. There'll be like podcast alley and there'll be rows of tables set up with the other legal podcasts. And so being in there makes people go, oh, wait, what's that show? And, you know, we literally, literally made like little square business cards just for the show for people to take. And we're interviewing interesting people. So attendees would walk by and be like, oh, you know, I should listen to that because so-and-so is going to be on the show. So just getting out there within my circle, sort of influence and in my community of lawyers, the word spread. Yeah. So I, I, Dan and I, um, for for Archive 81, um, get this this question a fair amount. And I'm never 100% sure how to answer it just because like most of it is luck, I would say, and timing and a lot of stuff that's outside of your control. What you can control, however, I would say that the m- one of the most important things about uh, a podcast are the visuals. And by the visuals, I mean the artwork around the podcast. So the cover image that you'll see on, um, on uh, Apple Podcasts or Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts, that is one of the most important things you can do to promote your podcast is to have a good cover image, which means a professionally designed one or something that looks professionally designed, something that's not like a, you know, image of a microphone or something or something cliche or like a black and white image or like a clip art stuff. The saying is never judge a book by its cover, but, you know, covers are how you're supposed to judge books and podcasts. Like that's the whole point of covers. So that is one of the uh, most overlooked uh, aspects of promotion, I would say. The other aspect, social media. However, I would say that, especially for fiction podcasts, social media is a little bit overrated. Like, you know, tweeting about your podcast is, is also, it's just exhausting and annoying. And I, per, you know, I personally absolutely hate doing it. So that's that's colored my my perception of it a little bit. I don't think it's nearly as useful as being recommended by other podcasts. So by and I think Megan, this goes into what you're saying about uh, conferences and podcast alleys. Is like if you know other podcasters or podcasts that have like a similar audience that you're trying to go for reaching out to them, talking with them, and not being mercenary about it, being a, hey, I like your podcast, like, let's connect, is a really good way to be like, okay, hey, I'll put an ad for your podcast, or you'll put an ad for mine, and that doesn't necessarily have to be like a explicit agreement, it can just be like finding the community of fellow people who make the same type of stuff you make, and joining that community will be kind of part of that. I think is probably the way that you actually get legitimate word of mouth going. And that's how you, you know, actually build your audience growth. Yeah, that's, that's it. Awesome. I think, yeah, artwork is such a big thing because again, we, we I just emphasize, oh, this is only an audio format. Mm-hmm. And it's like, just kidding. There is one or two visuals <laughs> that do matter, but not like how you record, but how you advertise it. And I mean, cool graphics is, goes a long way for like mm-hmm. just about anything. I, it's a good way to kind of like segue because you mentioned like appearing on the Spotify or the Apple store. How do people list their podcasts online for people to find in these like bigger mm-hmm. formats? Is it 
Is it hard? Do you have to pay money? What Very is it? Easy. Very easy. And sorry, I, I don't mean to kind of, I, I think, yeah. So there's, there's a couple ways. So first off, and I, this is what I would recommend for people that are starting out and, and, you know, don't necessarily have a, a organization behind them is for you to go to a podcast host. Like the one I would recommend is Libsyn, but there's others out there. So podcasting, to get a little bit technical out, uh, about it, is essentially an RSS, which is a feed that basically tells podcasters, which is how you listen to podcasts, like so Spotify, Pocket Casts, Apple Podcasts, basically says, go here and get this audio, and you will put it on your podcast and people can listen to it. So how you put the RSS feed up, there's a bunch of ways to do that. The thing I would recommend is a podcast host, like like Blurberry, like Libsyn is the one that Dan and I use, and this, that's the one that we would recommend. But you can also put it on SoundCloud and create your own RSS feed manually. But I'm guessing a bunch of people's eyes glazed over when I said RSS feed manually. So I would recommend using a podcast host. And podcast host will put it put your RSS feed to the major podcasters, podcatchers automatically. And alternatively, if you set up your RSS feed yourself, you can essentially submit your feed to iTunes, to Apple Podcasts now, that they stopped going by iTunes, and Spotify and Pocket Casts and Stitcher and all the other podcast platforms. And you can do that manually. And there's usually a form on their website that you can fill out and put in. If you're making a podcast and you're talking about something like television or movies, is there any like legality issues or copyright issues if you're basically doing a review show or hot take show or, you know, that kind of thing? Well, yeah, not unless you're going to actually play clips of something that belongs to someone else. So keeping in mind, I mean, to be covered by a copyright, that means that it's original content that's been recorded in some way. So your show is covered by copyright just because you recorded it and it's original. <laughs> it's you talking and this is new and the sound of your voice and your choice of words. Now that's going to be covered by copyright. So as long as you're not taking someone else's content that, that would also be covered by a copyright and replaying it on your show, you're not going to have a copyright problem. The problems that you could have, you just have to be sort of creative in the way you think about it and, and looking broadly for issues before you go on and start talking. The biggest issue that I sort of would foresee is simply slander. So libel and slander laws, you know, libel is when it's printed, slander is when it's spoken. It's essentially, you can't be out there spreading false information that also damages a person. So remembering that it needs to be false in order to be a problem. If you're speaking about your opinions or truthful information, there is nothing that really can, can harm you with that. You're probably going to be completely protected under our free speech laws. So for the most part, you're not going to have a problem, even if you're talking about a TV show or a concert you went to or how someone performed your opinions, that would all be protected material that you would be free to talk about on a show. Oh, this, this might be a fun one and there's probably no right answer, but uh, could you share your insights on what the ideal show length could be you know they've been 15 minutes and over 60 minutes and it, is there a sweet spot that you can achieve well do my space is mostly interviews and I would normally listen to other people's shows similar to mine for yeah, content ideas and strategies on how they run them and I gotta tell you when I see anything over about 45 minutes I start to go oh really like I just maybe it's me maybe it's my attention span I love like 20, 25 minute shows. I think most of mine are probably closer to 45. I always tell people we're booking for an hour to talk, but I don't expect the show to run that long. I suppose it's different for really different audiences. You know, what do you, what do you, who are you trying to target and how long is their attention span? What, when are they listening to it? If you can really drill down and figure that out about people, but I would expect like a drama would be very different. You know, I'll easily watch an hour of TV. But I don't want to listen to an hour of an interview. So it seems like it would be different genre to genre. Oh, it depends. It depends so much on the specific podcast that you have and that you want. Like 
I mean, I will listen to a three hour thing of two uh, comedians discussing discussing terrible movies, but like, that's probably not a great length for an NPR interview, you know? Like the ideal show length is as short as you can make it without sacrificing anything. And with, you know, like it's, it just depends so wide, widely on, on what exactly you're going for. I would say if you're, if you're like, oh, should this be shorter or longer? The answer is shorter. It's better to be, to be brief than to be long-winded as long as you can get all the information out and it's uh, what, you, what you want. I mean, the cardinal sin of podcasts is two boring people talking for two hours. Like, so you do want to avoid that, I would say. Like the, the per, you know, comedians in their basement talking trope. That's, that's a little played out, but, you know, it really depends. I, you know, there are great 20 minute podcasts. There are great two and a half hour podcasts. Besides, the length of a podcast does not matter. It, it really does beyond like what you're going for, you know? I hate, I hate the answer. It depends, but it does depend. Mark, that's a lawyer answer. It is. <laughs> it depends. Oh. Yeah. Well, I will share this sort of nugget on that topic is that much as I feel, you know, obviously you can look at my face. Like I can't stand the ones that get too long. My mm-hmm. most downloaded episode was the longest interview I've ever recorded. And I think that episode runs like an hour and 20 minutes. But my guest was this high flying, massively successful lawyer years and years ago with a crazy drug habit, like something out of the movies. I mean, it's, it was wild. And then he spiraled downhill, he crashed and burned so hard and then came back and he's a law professor now. And he talks all about not just the recovery. Cause like not, not to downplay it, but like a lot of people talk about recovery, but he, he will talk openly about the wild times and how he was actually practicing law while engaging in this habit and hiding it and how it all you know, came together. It's fascinating. And that episode, you know, like I said, most downloaded and longest. So it has to be engaging and that should really be your focus more than the length. And just a, a quick question that, you know, kind of, again, not officially asked in the chat, but I think there's a good, this is a good segue to it. You know, both of you have said this keyword, like, oh, having a really good idea, or you've said things that don't work, like people chatting in their basements. And I find myself (laughs) with this problem too. Like I, like, I love scams and scam stories. And I try to listen to a podcast that someone recommended to me. And it was just like two people, like, kind of like shooting the shit, but not really talking about scams. And I'm like, oh, it's 20 minutes of them just like joking around before I actually get to hear what I want to hear. So like, what what exactly makes a good idea and then I mean there are plenty of like conversational podcasts that are very successful so is there any like secret recipe or something that you notice these things have in common that maybe help apart from maybe it's already a celebrity doing it I guess yes so the secret to making a good podcast that will make you a ton of money and will get you picked up by Spotify is I mean be good if, if I knew that, I would, you know, be on, be on my private podcasting jet and I'd be, you know, having Joe Rogan's deal. Not his beliefs, this is billion dollar podcast, uh, podcast deal. But I will say that, like, I think the thing that, like, differentiates, like, a good two hour cheap or shit thing from a bad two hour cheap or shit thing is the fact that the people talking have an actual purpose like it's not well they're not they're actually answering a question and the question doesn't have to be here's you know why did you know uh, the mongol empire fail it doesn't have to be like a specific question but they're they have a central thesis that they're getting at. so it's not just aimless it's it might be depressive but it's not but there's there's a passion there you know i feel like i'm uh, talk, talking around it a little bit, but like, I think the main thing is just people have a clear idea of what they want to do and why they want to do it. And the why they want to do it is not just, 
well, I want to have a podcast. It's yeah, it has to be like two steps beyond that, I would say. Yeah, for interview format, you know, to me, the thing that makes it engaging is that the people talking are just having a conversation and it doesn't sound scripted and forced. The person being interviewed isn't trying to sell something. I mean, yeah. just think about what do you want to listen to? And mm-hmm. I'll tell you, you know, I've listened to one episode of a whole lot of podcasts. Make notes when you <laughs> listen to those. I mean, the sales thing is huge. Oh, those those are so irritating, right? The person who's just there to sell you something. Mm-hmm. I want to have a hear a conversation. I want to learn something. I want to spend, mm-hmm. you know, I'm giving valuable time to listen to this podcast. What am I going to get out of it? And if you're delivering something of value, that is one that someone's going to want to listen to. I will add, add to Megan's point, I think, which is, I think that like, especially in the audio fiction space, there's a lot of podcasts that don't really want to be podcasts. They want to be TV shows or they want to be adapted or, you know, for interview-based podcasts or conversational podcasts, they don't really want to be podcasts. They want to be like a thousand orders of Shopify or whatever, or like a promotional tool for, for something else. And I think focusing on, okay, how am I going to make this piece of audio media the best it can possibly be. And that means obsessing over sound quality. That means making sure that, you know, the podcast isn't a minute longer than it should be. And like really making the be- the podcast that you would want to listen to, you know? Because I'm sure that, you know, Renee and, and Megan's and my like podcast tastes are very, very different. Like, you know, one of my favorite shows is just, three dumb comedians in Brooklyn talking about like the news of the week, but I listen to it religiously because it, you know, I connect with it. And it's because these people are making what they want to make, you know, it, it feels like a cheesy answer. But. How have your podcasts evolved over time? And do you have any metrics to evaluate or, or feedback to make changes? Yeah, I can tell you mine got a little more systematic over time. I really was just like, let's just get this thing started. We planned out, I think like five episodes, recorded three, got them all out there at once for the first three. So there were multiple things to download. And it was very much winging it each week. Like, what should we talk about now? Who's free to do it now? (laughs) You know, we bounce around. And then there were times we we got a little more intentional about it and said, okay, we're going to do, you know, five episodes in a row on a particular area, you know, not the same topic because each of my episodes, I tried to really make standalone. So you could pick up anything at any time, but we'd say right now, bar exam scores are coming out. Let's talk about wellness, dealing with failing the bar exam. Let's talk about studying again. Let's talk about sharing the news when you have passed, like what, what are the next steps, that kind of thing. So we definitely got more intentional. We also got more systematic with doing solo episodes and interview episodes. So we got to the point where we wanted to go back and forth and alternate them. So one week it would be an interview, the next week it would be a solo. And that became much more clear. Metrics, Libsyn, the host that Mark was mentioning earlier is great for that. You can see your downloads. We'd also get feedback from the audience. So we'd always put in there, you know, hey, reach out to me on Twitter anytime. Love to hear from you. And that was when we realized, oh, people are listening. (laughs) That was kind of crazy. Like we missed a week. I forget why, but we had missed a week. And then I got a bunch of DMs on Twitter. Like, oh my gosh, I couldn't see your new episode. Is everything okay? I'm like, they're paying attention. That was like, you know, very affirming kind of moment. So that's not a super measurable metric because you've only heard from a handful of people versus, you know, several hundred or downloading it. But you can see on Libsyn how many were downloading. And then you can see the handful that reached out to. So I got a lot more interested in following those download metrics as my primary one. And then we would take that information and use it to plan future episodes. Like, oh, a ton of people downloaded the episode on this particular topic. Let's take it a step further, dive deeper. Let's do another one on that. Or let's interview someone who's an expert on this. So that in that way, it it assisted us as well. So how... Have your podcast over over time. Um, Dan and I, for for the fiction podcast, Dan and I have been extremely lucky in that our podcast got pretty popular fairly fairly quickly. So we were able to get ads and start a Patreon and pay our actors and the people 
works for us fairly well. So a lot of the changes in the podcast have just been based on like, oh, now our budget is in the tens of thousands of dollars rather than, you know, 400 uh, or a thousand at the, at the very beginning. So I think, I think that's the main changes. The other changes, we don't really respond to, you know, fans and stuff other than to kind of make fun of them. You probably shouldn't do that. Like it's lovingly make fun of them within the show, to, to be clear. We, Dan and I kind of make the podcast for ourselves and, and what, what interests us. And we'd much rather, you know, fail at doing something we're interested in rather than just fail to please people that, you know, you're probably not going to please all the time. Once again, wishy-washy answer, but yeah. As for, oh, as for metrics, the there's a there's a couple of ways you can get metrics. Uh, Libsyn is really good for that. Unfortunately, we started releasing our podcast via the manual SoundCloud RSS feed, which was not the best decision early on, but it was the uh, decision that costs the least amount of money. So we used the people that do our ads, uh, Authentic, have their own proprietary like metrics that that you can actually, I, I believe the metrics are free that you can, you can use them. So we used those metrics and that the, the thing about podcast metrics is that they are extremely, extremely difficult. So for the most part, it's very difficult to know how many actual subscribers you have and how many people have actually listened to your podcast because there's a bunch of different types of podcasters and we have different definitions on what a listen is and what a download is. So, you know, you can't really say, oh, these, this is my audience. Uh, you're still a little bit unclear of that, but Libsyn probably gives you a rough estimate, which is, which is all you can ask for. This is probably a quick question for you, Mark, but apparently Archive 81 is marked explicit on some of the platforms. Is that something all of them. is oh all of them? Is that something oh, you, you self-select or is that yeah? I mean, we like, have someone eat a eat a eat the heart out of a goat in a magic ritual. <laughs> so, and like, you know, murder their own father with an obsidian bust is the Sorry, that's a that is a hundred percent a spoiler. Like it's a it's an explicit podcast. So Libsyn very easy to to market. You manually do the do the RSS feed. You should you might have to manually input that on the separate podcasters as you give them give it to them. But I mean, the the thing is like I'm not I'm not a hundred percent sure. Like there's no there's no real like. I don't think it's against the, like, there's no real guidelines for what counts as an explicit podcast and what doesn't. Like, I mean, we err on the side of caution, but for the most part, I, I see, I've seen like really, really explicit stuff, not marked explicit. And then some, some very tame stuff. It's like, well, I guess someone says shit on it, but is that explicit? So I wouldn't worry too much about it. Yeah, the way it was explained to me, um, because mine, you know, in general, not explicit, was if someone cursed on the show, we mm -hmm. would mark it explicit. That was unusual, and which is sort of funny because a lot of other lawyer shows <laughs> get every episode full mm -hmm. of everyone throwing around cuss words. But I guess, I don't know, it's like the mom and me and people aren't cussing around me or something. And I preferred that we not have to market that way just because I know that a lot of my audience mm -hmm. would listen like in the car, dropping their kids off or mm -hmm. maybe as they waited for their kids at school. And so we just kind of made the decision to you know, try and keep the language tame, but we marked them explicit if we needed to, but that was episode by episode. So the sh whole show doesn't have to be marked that way. As you mm -hmm. upload it like into Lipson, there's certain, you know, check boxes and that's one of them. And the way that it was explained to me also was that for my purposes, like as, you know, being out there as something of a marketing vehicle, my show wouldn't really be filtered out except in some foreign countries where mm -hmm. they wouldn't allow an explicit show to come through the podcast player. And that was fine because I don't need anyone overseas usually to be hiring me. So it wasn't a big deal if I marked an episode explicit. How do you decide like how many episodes you're going to have? Or if a conversation goes long, how do you decide how to divide it into like, oh, conversation part one, part two? 
Is that something you pre-plan or did it kind of organically come out that way? For me, I, w- I think I've only got a couple that might be in parts. It was just the conversations ran really long and that was not planned. You know, typically like we were supposed to have ended by now, but we're having a really awesome conversation. I don't want to cut you off, but gosh, this is getting really long. There's a, you know, we find a good segue, split it in half, call it two episodes. Yeah. I mean, for a fiction one, it's, it's definitely different because all the stuff is planned in advance and, you know, like, I guess you could improv or, uh, too long and has to have to be cut, but yeah. So it's, it's all pre, it's all pre-written. Uh, each, each season and to the NPR side, if you're wondering like, Hey, why are, you know, why is fresh air always a certain amount of time? It's because we all serve the master of the show clock, which is, which means that there's about 50 minutes, five, zero minutes and 30 seconds for content for each NPR show. Mark, you already alluded to this a little bit, but what, what is the budget for your show? And I guess for someone starting out, is there like a kind of budget range that might be like you might suggest for somebody? Mm-hmm. Um, so once again, this is a, this is going to be a fiction answer rather than a nonfiction answer because the costs for an interview show is, are markedly lower. We have paid our actors since the, the very beginning. Not a ton of money, but we've paid everybody. And as our intake has increased, we've paid our people more. So I would say that the budget for the first season of Archive 81 was about $1,000, $2,000 probably. And that is, so the, re, the reason we were able to keep costs so low is because we had already had access to audio equipment because Dan and I are both you know, uh, audio production boys and we have our own equipment that's good. And we didn't have to pay for that. We haven't had to pay for studio time because usually we can just use the studios we work for and they're usually cool with it. But like the reason that Dan, my, my co-producer, the co-creator of our character one, plays the main character and I play the person that intros and outros every episode is because we didn't want to pay. Well, I mean, we didn't, we, <laughs> that would have been a, a fair expense <laughs> and we didn't want to do that, even though, uh, you know, we're, we're not actors. And as soon as we could, we downplayed our acting involvement. What I, what I would recommend for starting out, if you're a fiction podcaster, is to write to the budget that you have, meaning that oh, I've got a great idea. There are 20 characters. There's a ton of stuff. And it's like, okay, how are you paying 20 people? The cool thing about fiction podcasting is that your sound effects and essentially your visual effects budget can be very, very low (laughs) because it's just, you know, you making making the sounds on your own. And if you're talented enough, you can do a really, really good job and pay a very, very small amount of money. But as so as archive 81 has grown in popularity and revenue the budgets have grown and the overwhelming majority of that are either like incidental travel costs but the overwhelming majority are uh, the money that we pay our actors so that is and that's we pay well above sac minimum we're not we're not a union because the the union agreements they don't really have a good one for uh podcasts so we just take a look at the agreements and we're like okay well we'll pay like five times the rate and we'll just be we'll be fine and i don't mean to interrupt but that's actually a really good point you just raised that even Mm -hmm. podcasts have to do sag um is there like wga and sag rates and and things like that even for the podcast world So, yeah, so essentially you never have to use union actors. And for the most part, we don't. We use mainly New York theater actors. If, for example, like, I am guessing that for, like, if you've listened to the interesting new audio drama podcast that featured big name actors, I am sure they've worked out a union agreement. And I am sure that's, that's, Fine. There's no specific union agreement for audio drama podcasting. When there is, Dan and I will almost certainly use it. As of now, we just pay people really well, or hopefully as well as well as we can, and above above market rates. And that's 
all we can do really. I think. And Megan, because your podcast, you know, obviously doesn't have as many expenses as Mark. Do you have a budget for it? And what is, what's that like? So that's actually one of those, how it's evolved questions. So I don't have the talents that Mark has to be able to do the recording just so and edit it and put it out there. So when I first started, I was paying someone, I don't want to say way too much, but I didn't know any better. So in this sort of style, it was very common for me to find production of like a couple hundred dollars per episode to put it out. And then I overheard, you know, other lawyers talking about their shows and they were even higher. They were paying like 200 just to have it edited with no show notes, with no other materials. Well, as my assistant and I got the hang of it, well, wait a minute, this doesn't make any sense. Why, why are we doing this? So then we scaled back and my assistant actually started being essentially the producer and we, we outsourced the editing and the graphic design quite inexpensively. So an episode's more like 50 to $75 to put out because we don't spend our time editing or doing the graphics. There did also come a point where I realized we were kind of overdoing it on individual graphic design for every episode that it, they weren't really being utilized the way we had planned in our marketing. And so we scaled that back even further. So essentially we only pay for editing and that's, you know, under $50 easily per episode. And then we just do everything else in house because once you, once the process is demystified, like once you've walked through it, you realize it's really not that hard. And I'm guessing your editing price, like that's also because the length is kind of on the shorter side and it's not super, super complex with like sound effects and mixing and all that, like that editing well, price, I assume would go up. I would kind of assume that too. I mean, we pay per minute of raw footage, oh, um, but we don't have much that gets cut. I mean, it's pretty much a clean, we don't have, I don't think our editing job is difficult. He would probably charge a lot more if we were mixing in multiple tracks and all, but it's not. I mean, we just, <laughs> we talk along and every time I'm like, oh yeah, sorry. Could you take that part out? That sounded really terrible. <laughs> and you know, so he is listening to it, but you're right. Our editing is relatively simple as any interview style or solo, you know, just talking about your topic is going to be. So I just, my last question, uh, Mark, it's a fun one for you because I'm sure some of the people here have their fantasies and daydreams. When Archive 81 was picked up by Netflix, had you been shopping it around or was it kind of like somebody there found it and was like, hey, can we do this? Like, what was the, what was the story for how that happened? Yeah. So essentially we, we didn't do any, any, that is not something that's Dan and I's job. That's not something we're really interested in. An agent, a really, really cool agent, Kim, you know, uh, essentially reached out to us when our podcast got popular, right? A, a few agents reached out to talk about development deals, and she was the only one that didn't use bro, unironically. So we picked her. And we're very glad she did, because we did, because she's really, really cool. And really awesome and an absolute pleasure to, to work with. Essentially, she shopped it around to a bunch of different places, shopped it around first to production companies, and James Wan's production company was interested. And so they took the reins on that, and then a few other streaming services and places were interested in that. And we went with Netflix. And it's been it's been a, a while. Uh, it's a lot, it's a longer process than you think it would be. But yeah, it's basically all I have. It's kind of like that advice, uh, like the less you care, the more likely it'll happen, you know? Because mm -hmm. uh, nice. yeah, nice. yeah, there's definitely, um, there's entire production companies out there that are like mm -hmm. scanning IP and being like, ooh, that's hot and upcoming. Let's let's mm -hmm. buy it. And so it seems like you guys got lucky in that regard where somebody yeah. found like, well, multiple people were like, oh, it's cool. So yeah. Yeah. And I mean, most, a lot of it was timing, you know, a lot of it was, was luck, you know, it's, it's not the, it's not like Dan and I made the podcast winning too. It's like, okay, the internet's favorite work bay is going to play the character I play in the podcast. That's the main goal. The main goal was to create an interesting podcast. And I, personally, I think that have, that that goal is probably 
is going to make it more likely that you'll be picked up rather than having, you know, being picked up as a TV show be your number one goal. Well, I hope this conversation was really informative to people. And of course, if you still have legal or creative questions, you can reach out. Thank you so, so much, Megan and Mark. It was so great to have you here today and just able to answer all these questions that came in. And it was a really fun, fluid conversation. (laughs) So thank you. And yeah, everybody have a good night and thanks for coming to CLA. 